seated. this morning. We stand in honor of you, Lord. And it is true, you are Emmanuel, and that you are with us here this morning. And it is true that you have a plan for our time together, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that today that you would work in our hearts, Lord God. There are things we need to know about you, Lord God. 
there are deeper things we need to know about you, Lord, concerning, Father, your heart, the way you are, Lord God. And Father, I pray that we go beyond the knowledge that we have, the counsel and the understanding that we have of you, and you would teach us, Father, more things about you, Lord God, about your love, Lord, about your hope, about your peace, God, and about your purpose. Bless your people, Lord God, as we look to you. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Please be seated. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Luke chapter 2 this morning. And it says, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Cornelius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into the Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and the lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there was in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, who will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. So it was when the angel had gone away from them into the heavens, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem, and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste, and found Mary and Joseph, and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they said, and made it widely known, the sayings which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those sayings which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these sayings and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told to them. First of all, I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas. This morning, I would like to share with you the reason why God sent the gift of His Son to mankind. God sent His Son to show us of His great love which would bring hope, which would bring peace, and which would bring purpose. There are many today who really do not understand God and why Jesus was really born. During the time of Jesus' birth, there was a lot of misunderstanding concerning God. When God created Adam and Eve, and most of you know that story, when he created Adam and Eve, they had perfect fellowship with God. You see, there was nothing separating them and God in any way. So they had a perfect understanding of God. Now, it doesn't mean that they knew everything about God. It means that they had nothing to block them to understand God in his ways and knowledge of him. They had no sin nature. So when they walked in the garden with God, on, 
every single day, all day, they learned about how God really was. They learned the nature of God. They learned about how great God's love for them. Every day, you know, I'm envious of Adam and Eve. And the Bible says we're not supposed to be envious. That is not a gift of the Spirit of God in any way. But there are things that people have concerning God that I would like to have. And yes, I have a good walk with Jesus and so do you. And we have the Holy Spirit that lives in us. But I wanted you to get the complete concept of this concerning two people that had nothing hindering them in the sense of fellowshipping with God. And I believe that Jesus Christ was when they fellowshiped. Every day, all day, they learned more and more and more about God. Every single day, they learned about the greatness of God's love. I, I just can't fathom that. Now, I believe during the time of the millennial, the most you know what that is, and we've been learning that in the book of Revelations, that there's going to be a thousand-year reign, that God's going to reign. Jesus Christ is going to reign from Jerusalem and the church is going to reign with him. But during that time, we're going to have full fellowship with Christ. And I believe we're going to learn these things in, into a depth that we can't even understand concerning God's love, God's hope, and God's purpose, and God's peace. Adam and Eve did this. They understood fully and learned every single day. And I can't fathom in the sense of to give you a greater understanding how important it is that we learn these things, especially in the days that we live. But before we learn them, I have a question for you. I have a few, in fact. What are your thoughts concerning God? What do you believe concerning how God is? Do you believe that God is a sugar daddy? For a lot of people do. They believe that God is here to sit and wait on you hand and foot. And that whenever you ask anything from God, he better be there and he better supply it or else. That is not the God that I know in any sense. That is not the true God. So what are your beliefs concerning God? And your thoughts may be, I really don't know God. I really don't understand how God ticks. The Bible teaches as a Christian, you are no longer a servant, but you are a friend of God. If someone was to ask you this morning, I want you to tell me about your best friend. Because your best friend is, is to be God. And if you don't know much about that person, you're in trouble. Or if you have a misconception about how that person is. When I was preparing for this thoughts and this message, I thought about the best friend I have is Jesus Christ, without a doubt. And I need to tell about my best friend, and that's Jesus. But I also need to tell them to those who are ready are their friend, and that's Christians. But can you really tell someone else about your best friend who is to be Christ? My wife is my second best friend. I have some men friends, but I don't know them in any sense. I can tell you what size shoe my wife wears, size seven. I can tell you what size dress she wears, size eight. I can tell you some other things, but I can also tell you what her gifts are, her talents, how she thinks. I can tell you that she's, I'm not going to say that one. I was going to say stubborn, but she's not. I'm sorry, Lord. My point is, I can tell when she looks at me what she's saying. One eyebrow goes up. And she doesn't have to say a word. I just tremble. The point is, I know my wife very, very well. I know what she's going to do and what she's not going to do. She thinks a lot like me, and I feel bad for her. The point is, I really know my wife. 
And God wants you to really know him. God really wants you to understand him. Because he's supposed to be your best friend. And God wants you to share that friendship, that knowing him with other people. There's a lot of people who have a false concept of who God is. And they have a tendency to project God in the unloving characteristic of people that they look up to. We tend to believe that God is going to treat us as others. We like to think that we develop our image of God from the Bible and teachings of the church, not from relationships, some of which have been painful. It's easier if God's image is simply based on learning and believing the right things in Scripture. And that's what God wants us to know. Now, there are people who tell us about God that really don't understand who God is in truth concerning the Word of God. The biggest reason for Christmas is God's love for man. So we want to share with you four things this morning about God. Not you, what you perceive God to be. And I'm hoping this morning that, that if your perception of God is different than what the Bible teaches, you'll take on the perception of God instead of what you have. That it be removed. So we want to talk about these things. The first one is God's love. God's love is totally different than anything that you have ever experienced in your life if you are a Christian today. The love that the Bible speaks of is called agape love. And it is only found in the scripture in the New Testament. It's found nowhere else in any other book. Yes, men write about books, but I'm talking about books but the Bible. This is where it originates, period. There are other loves that we speak about, and they're in the Greek, they're not in the English. We have one word for love in the English, and we use it amongst everything. I love my wife. I love my children. I love chocolate sundaes. I love McDonald's. No, I don't. That's the love that we have in English. But the Bible teaches in the Greek. Much of the Bible is written in the Greek, especially the New Testament. And they have different meanings. In fact, they have four different loves. The first one is called eros. It is a word that means physical or sexual love. So a man and a wife, a man and a wife has this kind of love for each other. It's called eros love. And there's a second word, sturgy, a word that is used for family love. So it's between a son and a father or a daughter and a mother. This is the second kind of love. And then there's phileo love, which is a friendship or an emotional feeling. None of these are used here. God's love is based on a choice. Please listen. Based on the choice, centered in his will. It is a choice that a person makes to place value on another person. God places value on mankind, period. It is an unconditional kind of love in the sense that it depends not on the object to meet certain requirements, but on the, the lover who chooses to love. Now let me ask you this question. How many of you ever thought, don't raise your hand, God doesn't love me anymore because, because, and you can fill in the blank. And your thoughts may be, because I don't deserve to be loved. And that is 100% true, but not concerning God's love for you. We don't deserve God's love, and God doesn't love you because you deserve it, because if that was the case, We'd always been in and out of God's love. And God's love is not like that. Love is an expression, the Bible teaches, of the nature of God. The first thing I learned about God and I experienced about God was the love of God. 
That is the first thing that God wants you to know. Because everything out centers and comes through that love. In 1 John 4, 8, it says, He who does not love does not know God. For God himself and his nature is love. One of the reasons God sent his son was to show man his nature. God is love, completely perfect love. If man would see God through the eyes of truth, many would open their hearts to him. But many people have made God through their own thinking or understanding and have made him lower than themselves. So how do I know that God really loves me? I know that the Bible says it. The Bible teaches this. Love can be known only by the action it prompts. God is seen in the gift of his son. I want to read a scripture to you. This is in 1 John 4, 9. And this was manifested love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we may live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation or the payment for our sins. So God speaks to us and teaches us this morning that it is his love and the proof of his love is that God sent his son. This is the action that proves that God loves you and you and me. We have a big cross up there and God sent his son to die for your sins and it is a proof. You cannot say, I don't believe God loves me and look at that cross. You cannot say that. God and love is an action proven by God himself. Now I will say this. It is important that we understand that love prompts action. You've heard me use this illustration before. God desires for us to show proof of love by action. We live in a America that says, I love you, and that's all that it means. That if I say it, that means I love you. And that is not true in any relationship. I'm going to say it again. That is not true in any relationship. And that is not true in our relationship with God. God extended and showed the proof of his love by sending Jesus. That is God's side of the relationship. And the moment we'll see ours. But it's important that we understand. Because we are so mistaught, so to say, concerning what love is. Now, this love has made a choice. And it's been made by God. And it has nothing to do with the person who is loved. Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8 says this, The Lord did not set his heart on you and choose you because you were more numerous than any other nation. For you were the smallest of all nations. Rather, it was simply that the Lord loves you. And he was keeping the oath he was sworn to your ancestors. That is why the Lord rescued you with such a strong hand from the slavery, from the oppression, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Beloved, this is a very humbling and freeing thought. God loved me not because of anything has to do with me. But it has to do with his choice of loving you and me. You know, when first I first became a Christian, I was amazed that God loved me. And the reason why I was amazed because I know how I am. I know my thoughts. I know my ways. I know the way I live. I know how selfish I was. I know that mind of mine. And I thought, how could God choose me? He, he must have made a mistake. There must be something wrong with God. He can't be perfect because he chose me. 
And you may say, I understand, Pastor, why you feel that way. But I want to say the same thing about you. I want to say, I don't understand why God chose you. But I do understand. I'm not contradicting myself. I do understand. Because it has nothing to do with the person that's loved. It has to, be, it has to do with the person that loves. It has to do with God. And God only. And it has nothing to do with how valuable are. As we become Christians and we walk with God for a period of time, God begins to change us. We begin to become more like Jesus. And what happens to us, or can happen to us, is we begin to think, yeah, now I can really see. I can understand why God loves me. Look at me. Man, I'm so different. And it's true. You are very different. But don't forget the nature that's still in you. In 10 seconds, you can be loving God and loving people. And when they're a matter of a split second, you can come out of this room and be mean and irritated and yell at your kids and even sock someone. Or get on that road and start driving down that road and get rage. <laughs> get out of my way. Oh, wait a minute. I just went to church. I was loving it. That's what can happen. Amen? And I've, it's happened to me. Now, I want to re-emphasize this. God's love cannot be earned or deserved. God chooses to always love me and to love you. Now, this does not mean that he loves our acts if they're wrong or if I treat people wrong. God wants us to keep ourselves in the love of God, Jude says. Now, the Bible describes God's love and describes it in many different ways, has many different aspects to it. First of all, God's love is sovereign. Deuteronomy 10 and 15. Yet the Lord chose your ancestors as the object of his love. And he chose you, their descendants, above all other nations. As is evident today. So in other words, that word sovereignty, God's love is sovereign. It means it's superior to all things. It is more excellent, more sure, and it cures and it's a remedy for our hearts. God made us to be loved. God made us to love. But he also made us to be loved. And when we receive God's love, the Bible said it cures us. I have to have God's love. I personally believe that God made a space in every single heart. And he can, he's the only one that can fill it. And he fills it with his love. And I have to have that. I have to know that God loves me. But I have to understand how that love is received. And I have to understand the way God says that love is. Not how I perceive it. I have to lose my understanding when it comes to God's love. Of my way of thinking. Not his. God's, rate, God's love is great, the Bible teaches. Ephesians 2.4 But God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us. They say that whatever the more costly, the more that is paid for, the value is presented. God had one son and one son only, the Bible teaches. There's no other son. There is no second person in the Trinity but Jesus Christ. And God knew that man, sin had to be paid for. And God said, I will send the only price that will fulfill the payment of justice. I will send my only begotten son. That's how great God's love is. I don't believe there's not one person in this room who would give their children up for somebody else especially somebody hateful and sinful and angry and resentful and bitter and we can go on. But God does. The Bible teaches that God's love is abiding. Zechariah 3.17 The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He will save. He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He will joy over thee with singing. So it's continually 
That's what the word abiding means. And without change. God's love never changes. Let me ask you a question. How many, after you've done something wrong, said, thought this? Well, God, sorry, but I know what I deserve. I, I, we have some serious problems now, God. You just don't love me like you used to. And God says, I'm not going to change when it comes to loving you. I don't care. I don't believe that God's angry as Christians at Christians in any way. I never am angry at my children. Ever. You may say, oh, come on, pastor. That's not human. I'm not angry at my grandchildren especially. They can pull my hair. They can do anything they want to do and I'm not angry at them at all. They might hurt. And God is much greater than that. God's love is not is unfailing. Isaiah 49, 15, and 16. Can a woman forget her suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget. Yet will I not forget thee. Behold, I have graven thee on my hands and on the palms. Thy walls are continually before me. God's love will not fail you. God promises. Listen to what Romans 8, 39, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate you from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the Bible teaches in Jeremiah 3 that it's everlasting. Here's, listen to what Job says. He says this after he loses his children, he loses everything he owns, and he has boils all over his body. This is what he says. What is man that you should make so much of him and that you set your heart on him. Could you imagine being in this place of Job? And this is what he says about God. God, I just, it's unbelievable how you're always thinking about me and caring about me. His thought could be this. I can't believe you, God. Here I am in all these things. Don't you love me? Don't you care about me? Don't you even think about me? Look what's happening to me. He says the opposite. Completely. And that's what we should do, the same thing. God really does love you. Like no other. He loved you so much, he was willing to send Jesus to allow you to live with him forever. There may be times in your life when you'll begin to question whether God loves you. It's usually during a time of difficulty that we begin to think this. Sometimes it's when God doesn't answer a prayer. Sometimes it's when God doesn't seem to even be there. But we need to go back to the basis, basics and recall just what God has done for us. If God allows difficulty in your life or if he doesn't answer your prayer the way you want, understand that it's because of his great great love for you remember God does what is best for you who is loved not what you think is best for you that is love now why is it so important that we understand God's love and we accept God's love you can be a Christian today and not understand how much God loves you. You can be a Christian today and not receive unconditionally God's love for you. And because of that, your life can be full of mountains and fears. I said to you earlier, the first thing I learned about God was how God loves me so much. And I, the reason why I had to learn that that way is because there were fears in my life that I didn't understand. There were mountains that had to be removed and only God's love could remove those mountains. And there are mountains in your life that only God's love can remove. God love dispels fears of the future What's happening today in our lives, 
maybe sickness, of death, of judgment. If we will accept the love of God in our hearts and trust God, these will be dispelled, God promises. And I've seen it happen in my own life. For the one who is in charge of a Christian life is in control and his love for you will bring only what is best for you. I have no fear of the present. God loves me and is watching over me and will not allow anything to come except it be for eternal good. And I'm okay with that. Anything you want to do for me, in me, for eternity, God, I'm okay with that. And that's what God works toward. I have no fear of my immediate future. Jesus has promised to be with me even to the end of the age. The Holy Spirit dwells within me. Thus greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And I have no fear of eternal future. Jesus has promised to prepare a dwelling place for me with him. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. If you have these fears, our fears of these things, they're not made perfect in love, 1 John 4, 18 says. So I know without a doubt, whether anyone else believes this or not, God loves me. And I know that God loves you because God proves it here in the scripture by actions, not just words. But how am I to respond to this love? First of all, I must accept God's love by faith in what God has told me and by the actions that are proven. I must also respond in loving God. I can't imagine a person in a relationship where it's one-sided, although there are those kind of relationships. And I must say that with relationships, sometimes one gives 80% and one gives 20 and the other, uh, there are other times it flips with husbands and wives. Sometimes the wife needs to give 80 or the husband needs to give 80 or whatever it may be. There's different times with that. I understand that and it's true. But for it to be one-sided in being a Christian is untrue. I am to respond to God's love and I am to love God in return. There is no greater relationship and there is no more important relationship than my relationship with God because every, and listen, every single relationship stems through my relationship with God. If you think you have a great relationship with God and you have a horrible relationship with your husband or your wife or your children or your neighbor or your work people, whatever it may be, you're deceiving yourself. My relationship with God is going to enhance and purify on my part my relationship with others. That's why many times when we take the Lord's Supper, God says, I want you to examine yourself. And God will show you people that you have problems with, that God wants you to forgive. It even says this, don't you take the Lord's Supper. You get your little buns out here and you go take care of this problem first. You have a problem with your brother, go deal with it first before you partake of the Lord's Supper. That's how important it is. So we are to respond to that relationship of God's love. And how do we respond? Well, I love you, God. Let me tell you, I met two people this week. And automatically when people meet me, because they know I'm a pastor, especially if they go to church here or they went to church here, this is what they say to me almost every time. Pastor, I really love God. I really love God. And unfortunately, sometimes I know exactly what's going on in their lives. I know they're living with somebody. I know they're not living the truth concerning the Word of God or allowing the Spirit of God to work. They're totally contrary to what the Bible teaches. And so the other day, the Lord said to me, I want you to say something. I said, you love God, huh? I go, yeah. And I said, are you walking with God? Is God your first love? 
Are you obeying his commandments? Are you loving your wife? He wasn't loving his wife because he's living with somebody. My point is, the words are so cheap when we say, we love God. Oh, I love God so much, Pastor. Here's what God says. Here's, these are the words out of Jesus' lips. If you love me, remember what he says? Keep my commandments. If you love me. Let's go back to Adam and Eve for a second. I can't imagine, again, the relationship they had face to face and learning about the love of God. But in that intimacy, without a doubt, they were loving God, without a doubt. They were keeping God's commands, without a doubt. And God expects that from us. Not perfect. You're not going to live everything and not make a mistake and not sin. No, the Bible says if you sin, we have an advocate. We can go to God and ask us to forgive us. But the point is, am I really loving God back in response? We celebrate Christmas and it's the most, one of the most wonderful times of the gift of God and His love. But am I responding to that great love that God has for me? God also says, in keeping his commandments, that I am to love others. Christmas can be a wonderful time of family. It's supposed to be that way. It can be a wonderful time about God and having that relationship with him, experiencing God's love. But it can also be a time of very selfishness, self-centeredness, and our kids can learn the same thing. Christmas is about me. What would you get me this year? You didn't get me nothing? I wanted this. Why didn't you get me that? You didn't get me that? What? That's how it is. I thought you loved me. Oh, yeah? That's our concept of love. So we are to love one another, the Bible teaches. Let me read a scripture to you. This is for Christians. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9, and 10. But as touching brotherly love, you need that I write not unto you. For you yourself are taught of God love one another and indeed you do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia but we beseech you brethren that you increase more and more now he's really saying this you're supposed to love one another and you're doing it but I want you to do this I want you to grow even more we have a very loving body thank God we do you guys do love each other a lot and it's so wonderful but let me say this to you just like Paul was saying to these Thessalonians I say this to you you need to decrease in that love especially during this time of the year. You need to love one another. Now, you may say, I, I can't love that way. In the book of Romans chapter 5, this is what it says, verse 5. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who gave or was given to us. Now look at me. If you are a Christian and the Holy Spirit lives in you, raise your hand. Okay? So you have the Holy Spirit. And what is the greatest fruit that comes out from the Holy Spirit? Tell me. It's love. It is love. And God says, the Holy Spirit lives in you. I shed my love abroad in your heart. It's in there. Now I want you to love others with my ability because you can't do this in yourself. But there's somebody in the way. You know, it's like a stopper in the sink that doesn't let the water run through. And you know who that stopper is? It's my husband. I know it is. If he would just be removed, he just stops me from loving. No, it's not my husband. It's my wife. No, it's my kids. No, it's the boss. No, it's... The problem is, look in the mirror, that is the person, that's the problem, that stopped because God has shed his love abroad in your heart. You are capable, just move out of the way. God wants us to love, and that's part of the response. Now let's go to the second thing, and I'm going to run right through this quickly. Hope. When Jesus came, there was despair in people. Their hope was probably just almost all gone. 
Some had been waiting for the Messiah, but there were really no evidence of his coming. There was no great Jewish ruler on the scene. They were under the strong hand of Rome, controlled by tyranny. So hope was diminished. God sent Jesus to give us real hope. Hope that is eternal. Beloved, hope is very important for man to have. Man today seems to have little hope for the future. God sees this today, and that's part of why he sent Jesus. We live in hopeless times. Many people are in despair, are full of depression. Many are very scared. Let me read to you exactly what the Bible teaches concerning and describes this word. Expectation of good, hope. Expectation of good. You can remember that, it's pretty easy. But I want to describe to you even a little bit more. Webster describes it as feelings that what is wanted will happen. Desired accompanied, accompanied by expectation. The thing that one has a hope for, a reason for hope, Hope against hope to continue having hope through it seems baseless. Listen to what the psalmist says. And this is, I believe, David. When he became hopeless, this is what he says. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? How many of you ever felt that? Every one of you should have felt that some way or another because I felt that way. And he makes this statement, hope in God. And literally what he does is he speaks to himself. Now, before we get on that topic, I'm not talking about people who walk around the street because I see them too. And here they are talking to themselves. I'm not talking about that. But I am talking about literally talking to ourselves concerning hope. You need at times to talk to yourself because you're going to have times that you feel discouraged, you do feel depressed, how many have felt like giving up? Don't raise your hand because every one of you have. And literally, I've gone through that same thing and this is what I do, exactly what this psalmist do. I talk to myself. I said, no, no. You need to hope in God. God's in control. God's in charge. Scripture will come into my remembrance of God and who He is and how He's in charge of all things. And it'll bring me back to all the things that God has already done. And He's been faithful. And this is exactly what the psalmist does. You love it. Mankind puts its hope in many things. Hope I'll win the lottery. I hope I get the dream house. I hope that that dream job comes to. Or I hope for one true love. I hope I'll be totally successful in my occupation. These are not bad things in themselves. But if this is our ultimate hope, what if it fails? And really, what future are lasting concerning these things? They are here today and gone tomorrow. For us as Christians, our hope is in a person. Our hope is in God. Again, I want to read another scripture. 1 Peter 1, 19 and 21. With the precious blood of Jesus, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God and raise him up from the dead and give glory to him, that your faith and hope might be in God. There are going to be times when the currents all around us want to sweep us out to sea. But Jesus keeps us safely anchored to God's harbor. The ancient anchor were much like the modern ones with iron hooks to grapple the rocks so to hold or to prevent shipwreck. When we really get a hold of the fact that God is on our side, it takes us through the storms. 
Let me ask you a question this morning. Are you shaky a little bit? This is what Romans 8.31 says. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his son, but delivered him up for all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Many of you know who this commentator is. His name is Matthew Henry. One of the men of God who walked with God and is very solid in his teaching. I want to read this to you, and it's a short paragraph. He writes, Wickedness shortens men's lives and frustrates their hopes. The years of the wicked that are spent in the pleasures of sin and drudgery of the world shall be shortened. Cut down the trees that cumber the ground, and whatever comfort or happiness a wicked man promises himself, in this world or the other, he'll be frustrated from the expectation of the wicked, which shall perish. His hope shall be turned into endless despair. That's what sin does. Now, I read a lot of different articles, and I want to read this to you. It's called, Why America, Our Americans Are Dying Younger and Younger. And please listen. For the third year in a row, according to a November report from the Centers of Disease Control, America's life expectancy has dropped. The last time this happened was, in, was a century ago, in 1915 to 1918, years marked by our entry into the World War I and the outbreak of the Spanish flu pandemic, which killed 675,000 Americans. This time, neither war nor pestilence is behind the drop in life expectancy. The threats are not external, but internal. The biggest factor behind the drop in life expectancy among Americans over the last three years are drug overdose and suicide. In 2017, more than 70,000 Americans died from drug overdose, and approximately 45,000 people intentionally took their own lives. These deaths, along with alcohol-related deaths, have been dubbed deaths of despair by the res researchers Ann Case and Agus Deaton. The despair referred to by Case and Deaton is largely economic, resulting from diminishing job prospects and other personal disappointments. As Case put it, your family life has fallen apart. You don't know your kids anymore. All the things you expected when you started out with in your life just haven't happened. As a result, people usually but not always men, turn to alcohol and drugs to ease the pain. An increasing number take their own lives. Certainly, Case and Deacon's exp explanation is partially true, but it doesn't explain the 30% of rise in suicide rates among 15 to 24 year olds who haven't experienced these kinds of disappointments. Nor does material deprivation explain why the suicide rate among African American and Hispanic is only about a third of what white Americans, despite being on average, they were poorer. Something else is going on, and it relates to the word despair. Chuck Colson and his friend, Richard John Nussis, used to remind people that despair is a sin. Now, if you define despair as extremely sorrow or grief, and calling it sin seems cruel and unfeeling. But that's not really what despair is. In the Christian view, despair is the opposite of hope. Thomas Aquinas wrote that despair is due to a man's failure, failure to hope that he will share in the goodness of God. For Aquinas, despair was more dangerous than even unbelief or hatred of God because by hope, we are called back from evil and induced to strive for what is good. And if hope is lost, men failing headlong into vice are taken away from good works. For Aquinas, nothing is more excusable than despair. For he who despairs loses his constancy in daily labors of his life. And that is worse, loses his constancy in the endeavor of faith. As a 16th century theologian, 
Isor of Seville put it, to commit a crime is death to the soul, but to despair is to descend into hell. If there is a better word than hell to describe the despair we see in so many Americans' communities, I'm not aware of it. Still, the question remains, what is the source of this despair? The answer lies in Aquinas' word, share in the goodness of God. Put simply, America places their hope in the wrong things. I'm not only referring to those who killed themselves, whether deliberately or indirectly, they're merely the most vulnerable victims of a world view that has us, in Isaiah's words, spending money on that which is not bread and working for what does not satisfy. Their disappointment is more keenly felt than ours. But make no mistake, the expectation of our culture exposes on us will ultimately end in death. If not physical, then spiritual death. We're told to seek satisfaction from things that cannot ultimately satisfy us, such as sex, stuff, and self. The results are what Aquinas would have predicted, a headlong fall into vice and away from seeking to do good. The most vulnerable among us wind up paying the ultimate price. But to know Christ in his resurrection is to know hope. May we never hide that in the culture that needs it so desperately. Beloved, those who are not Christians are without true hope. They are hopeless and many times and don't even know it. In Ephesians 2.12 it says this, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. This is where we used to be before we were Christians. Now we are Christians, the Bible says we have hope expectation of good. Every single day of your life, when you wake up, you should expect from God what God desires for you. And more than anything else, it is that deep relationship with God. So let me ask you this before we go on. How is your hope? Where is your hope? Is your hope in God? It needs to be. Or there is no other hope outside that is lasting and true for a Christian but God's hope. Quickly, we want to go through the third one, and that is peace. It comes from God and God only. It is Described as this, an in, no inner turmoil, no frantic friends of activity, no anxiety or worry, no strife against others. Competition or sinking control, none of that. A perfect inner rest, an inner quietness. God desires that for you as a Christian. That's what he came to bring. He came to bring you two pieces. First of all, a peace with God because sin separated you from God. Jesus Christ removes that. But there's a peace of God that God desires for you to have as a Christian. This is what God wants you to have. This is what God wants you to walk in. So how is this obtained? Very simply. Here's what the scripture teaches. He whose mind is stayed on thee, he will keep in perfect peace because he trusts in thee. Number one, I must keep my mind on Christ, on the things of God. And that may seem impossible, but God wants you to do that. If you want to walk in peace, God, I want to center everything on you. I want everything to go through you. Second thing is I must trust God. I believe without a doubt that God sits on the throne and God controls all things in my life. I believe that because God says that. I believe that my days are numbered and so are yours. God says that, Psalms 139. I believe that without a doubt. And I believe that God loves me and God's in control. So 
so I can trust him. I can trust that he knows what he's doing and everything he does is perfect. And the third one is, I must pray. The Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer, with supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. God says that. And when I pray, it says, I can have peace to fill my heart and my mind. So I must pray and release those to God. And when that happens, God makes a promise to me that I can have peace. You see, when I pray, I release those things that really weigh heavy on my heart and those people that I love and I care about, I have no control over, I release them in the control of God and then I'm free. That's what God promises. And the last one is God has given us the gift of purpose. Let me read a scripture to you and then we're finished. And it's in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. So God made you. And I want to read this word to you, because I looked it up in the dictionary. I had to do it that way, because it really doesn't say it in the Greek. The word purpose means the object for which something exists or is done. It means intention or plan with a specific end in view, not meaningless. That's what the Bible teaches, that God wants you to have a purpose. Outside of God, life is empty, meaningless, and has no purpose. It's just how it is. The Bible teaches that God created you, not just to exist. God created you to have fellowship with him, the living God. And when a man has a relationship, when a woman has a relationship with God, then the Bible says life becomes fulfilled, becomes satisfied. This is why I was created. Outside of that, man searches and searches and searches and tries to fill it with, you name it, you try to fill it. If I get this, I go there, I do this, I have that, I'm, you know what, I'm in trouble. Because it all leads to the same place. Thirstiness. No meaning. That's where it leads. And God says, I've come to have purpose. Now, I'm almost done, I promise. I've seen Christians who love God and walk with God. I met a lady the other day who came here. She lives in Santa Rosa. And I was talking to her about Jesus because if you come into this church, you're going to be talked about Jesus some way or another, whether it be through me or you or somebody else. But I said to her, are you a Christian? And she says, well, yes. And she said, I want to tell you something, Pastor. I got saved in the Jesus movement down in Pastor Chuck's church. I got born again. I said, that's awesome. So you were down there during the tent revival when they were in the tent. You were down there when they built the new church. I was down there for all that stuff. I said, then you're following Jesus? And she put her head down and said, no. For the last 30 years, I've been involved with the world and I worked at a wine company and I've been totally involved in my own occupation and making money. And I seen this woman just looking totally depressed. And it, it made me feel sorrowful and I can't imagine because I wasn't able to go into that tent revival and be part of that I wanted to be part of that I wasn't in any way I can't imagine when God does such a supernatural work getting so many people saved and God, the Holy Spirit working so mightily and people walking away but just like that one person and I talked to her I ministered to her she's going to start going back to church the thing is is this it can happen to you. And I've seen it happen. God worked in the lives of people. God saved them. God changed their heart. Give them a new life. And they go back into the world, their occupation, and their life becomes meaningless and purpose. They exist. 
Let me ask you this question. This morning, as a Christian, are you just existing? Is life just about one foot in front of the other? Today's Monday. Today's Tuesday. Today's Wednesday. Can't wait till the weekend. Is that where you are? You're in trouble. Walking away from God is a process, beloved. It doesn't take one time. I decide today, that's it. I'm walking away. It's a process. This lady took years to walk away. And the Holy Spirit did such a work in her. And she's seeing God work mightily. I'm saying this to you. Be careful. If you don't have purpose in your heart today, God desires to give you purpose. But let me tell you, it's about his relationship with you and him together. God made you to have fellowship with him. Outside of that relationship with God and that fellowship with God, you are going to be empty, you're going to be thirsty, and your life is not going to mean much at all. I'm going to end this teaching with this thought. God gave you the gift of his son. God desires to give, for you to give you, him the gift of your heart again. Father, we are grateful for your many, many blessings. Especially Jesus. Father, I can't imagine if Jesus wouldn't have came. We wouldn't have life, Lord God. We wouldn't have a relationship with you. We wouldn't have purpose or hope. We wouldn't know your love, God. So we want to thank you for Jesus, Lord God. I want to thank you for the freedom we have, Father, to be in your house, to learn of you and grow in you, Lord. And Father, I pray this morning that, Father, we have grown in the area of knowing you, God, understanding your love, understanding hope, Lord God, understanding, God, purpose, why we were created, Lord understanding their peace, Lord, and receiving those things from you. Pray, God, that every day we know you and love you more, Lord. And this morning, Lord, it is true, we drift, Lord God. So, Lord, we give you our hearts, Lord God. This is the start. But, Lord, every moment, every day, remind us, Lord, that our hearts belong to you. In Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen.